Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kapke, and I'm continuing a series called Master Databricks and Open Source Apache Spark. Now, what's great about this is we'll be talking about both, but realize that Databricks is really just a user interface wrapper around the Apache Spark platform. In this lesson, we'll be talking about structured query language, Spark SQL, and specifically using built-in functions. The Databricks icon at the bottom, if you can see that at the, the red bricks, that means that I'll be talking about Databricks specifically in this lesson, but later on I'm going to go circle back and do the same code on open source Spark using Zeppelin notebooks. So let's jump in. So what I want to start with is scalar functions. Scalar functions can be identified because they execute for each row in the data set. So you run a query, select whatever, and you wrap a column in a scalar function, and it will iterate that function code over every row, which means it can add significant overhead. Not too bad in the sense that at least it won't affect the, the way the data is distributed, but you can imagine that it's going to run that. It could be potentially on a billion rows or whatever, because you are in a big data environment. Most common use cases for scalar functions are things like reformatting data. Maybe you have a string and you want to, you know, maybe capitalize it or do something. Calculations, maybe you want to calculate the profit margin or something like that. So you use a couple of columns and calculate some new column. Or maybe you want to extract part of a column. And this is particularly popular when you're working with dates. Maybe you want to get the year or the month out of a date column. So scalar functions are very common. And I want to really stress you're using Spark SQL, which means it goes through the optimizer, which means it's going to be very uh, performant. So using scalar functions, anything you can do with Spark SQL is a good idea as opposed to, say, using some other language. Aggregate functions, and in particular when we're talking about data frames, which is what we're talking about here. Aggregate functions. Aggregate functions work on a group of data. The idea is I want to get the total sales by department or the average um, average profit margin for a group. So the idea is we're, we're sorting, we're grouping, and we're going to work on groups of data. So you're not going to necessarily get as many executions of the function as you would on scalar functions, but um, they can have a big impact because the functions are fine, but the grouping itself can cause what's called a shuffle, a partition shuffle, where it's basically redistributing the data. So you do have to watch out for that. But either way, again, aggregate functions, scalar functions, you're going to be in a better place because you're going to get the performance that Spark SQL can give you. So in this notebook, I'm going to walk through. You can see it has all the warnings about demonstrations and things like that. This code is meant to demonstrate. It's not meant to something you lift and try to run in your environment. Unless you're running AdventureWorks, you couldn't anyway. But it's uh, whatever you do, of course, make sure it complies to your standards and security, et cetera. All right, so I have uh, some links here, and I will put a link in the description of the video so that you can find this notebook. It's out on GitHub. I also put links to some of my other videos. One video I'll put a link to is where I loaded the data from. I have a video that walks you through taking CSV files and loading them into our Spark environment and Databricks, so creating tables from them. Now, we created a database earlier in that video, you, which we called AW Project, because we're using uh, demo data from AdventureWorks, which is a training data set Microsoft created a long time ago. We're going to say use AW Project, and that just points us to that database. So that way, all the tables and any statements, you know, selects, etc., automatically only apply to the AW Project. It's really just a namespace, though. It's not like a Oracle or SQL Server where you really have physically separate databases. This is more almost more like a folder heading because it's, it's a slightly different thing. But it's handy to be able to do this because we can have the same table names in different databases. Now, one thing I like to do when I'm going to work with SQL is get a list of the columns I'm working of the tables. So I want to see, well, what is in this table? We're going to use Factor Internet Sales because it has um, metrics, things we actually want to do like average and things on. Now, I've got some documentation here, and up at the top, I also links to bring you to this, the Spark documentation on functions, etc. So take a look. There's quite a few scalar functions you can use, and these are documentation on some of them that we're going to use here. First thing I'm going to do is, very common thing you need to do in queries is get the difference between two dates. Sometimes you want to convert it into like the years 
between two dates or the months. In this case, we just want the number of days because we want to do a diff between difference, basically date diff is the function, and it's going to subtract the order date from the shipping date because right we ordered it or somebody ordered it and then it got shipped out later we want to know how long did it take to get it shipped so that's a pretty common use case so again date diff here another one we might want is this format string and this is a really handy one that i've not seen for instance in most sequels it's really more of a throwback to c programming or something we have a format string and what we're doing in this is putting a string here order shipped on percent s and shipped a uh, short ordered on percent s and shipped on percent s now this percent s is going to be replaced by this which is another function so we're nesting functions we're calling a function within a function date format order date we want the order date to be displayed as year month day so we're telling it how to display it here all right we're going to do the same thing here and this order date is going to go here you ordered it on this date and you shipped it on right here that's going to be replaced by this. And that's because you might think, well, why not just plug in the order date, right? Well, the problem is the order date's a full timestamp, so it's got seconds in it. It's not going to display very nice. This way we can just get the year, month, day. And finally, I wanted to show a function here, to JSON. We're going to do to JSON, and you have to say name struct, so we're kind of nesting another function. And what it's going to do is it's going to give this as the uh, label, if you will, and then this is going to be the value that goes with it in the JSON format. And I'm going to limit this to just five rows because you get the idea. You don't need to see a lot of rows to get what's going on. But what we see here, days to ship, the difference in the particular case we're looking at, all of them are coming up to be seven days from ordering to shipping. The message we have, right, is on 2-10-12-29, uh, it was ordered and it was shipped on 11-05. All right, so that's the shipping, the order date to shipping date. And finally, the JSON function here, we can see that it's formatting as it should for a JSON file, name value pair. So here you have the label, the name, and then the colon, and then the value. So again, I thought that was a pretty cool function because there's a lot of times when you're going to extract data from wherever it is and you want to put it in another format, and JSON is a very popular one. So I thought you'd like to take a look at that and see that you can do that. Some other scalar functions we can do. This time, I'm going to be uh, just displaying the order date, but then I want to use the year function to extract just the year out of the order date. Order date. I'm going to get the day of month. So is it the fifth day of the month, the sixth day of the month? And I'll call that month day. And notice I can use the as. That's just a nice feature of SQL that you can rename a column. Otherwise, you get this ugly date of year function as the heading. Uh, this will be the actual day of the year. So it's important to think about when you need to do something in any language, but especially when you're doing something on Spark with SQL, what can you do in that language? Before you go off and start thinking, oh, I'll have to write something in um, you know, Python or R or some other language to do this, make sure you've checked to see if the function's already available in SQL, because if it is, it's going to be the most performant way to run it more than likely, and it's already done for you. And this is a pretty cool one, right? I like this because May 5th, whatever you can actually easily use this and it will tell you exactly what day out of the year that is and there may be good reasons why you want to map individual days of the year to when they occur in the year like sequentially so i thought that was pretty cool this is not really a function but it's one of my favorite statements uh in sql which is a case statement case statements allow you to run a series of conditions comparisons basically and then say assign this value okay what about this well then assign this value so here we're saying case when the day of the year for order date, right, we're going to get like it's 1, 2, 3, all the way through up to 365, is less than or equal to 100, then we're going to return early in the year. Uh, when the day of the year is between 100 and 101 and 200, middle of the year, otherwise just say it's late in the year because what else is there, right? There's nothing left. <laughs> uh, then we have to end it and we say time of the year. Now, this is a really, again, great statement to use with SQL. I love it just because you can do so much stuff with it. Technically, we could make this any condition we really want as long as it comes back as true or false. So we don't have to just do a single column evaluation, but it's it's pretty powerful. You can do a lot of things with the case statement, so don't forget about it. Uh, we're going to run this. We're going to do an order by. So now we can see our order date. We can see that the year did indeed take the year part of it out of the date. Again, a lot of times you might want to do that. Maybe you want to get a summary by year. 
A lot of people use date dimensions to do things like that, but that means you're going to be joining in more data. You'll probably add more overhead. So in this case, my guess is most of the time, just doing a function to pull out the year is going to be more efficient and performant than joining to another table. Month, day, you get this. So what day of the month is it? 29th. And then the day of the year, it's 363, right? Because you're almost done with the year in December, you can see over here. And then you can see, oh, this is where the case statement came in. And it's this value it's time of the year is late in the year, early in the year. We don't have any middle of the year. And that's it. Pretty cool. But Brian, you were going to talk about aggregate functions. What about them? Glad you asked. So let's talk about aggregate functions. Aggr fu aggregate functions are a lot fewer than the scalar functions. So that's the first thing to note. But as I mentioned, you'll know you're dealing with aggregate functions. For one thing, you'll probably see a group by clause. And I can say group by one here, which means it's going to order group by the first column. So that's the first thing. And as I mentioned, I can just do this year. And now I'm going to be grouping by the year column, just taking the year out of the order date. So a lot, this will cover a lot of the aggregate functions, but not necessarily all of them. So take a look at the link I have up here. But we're going to be doing, for instance, here, we're going to add up sales amount. And we can give it a different title, right? The column heading is total sales, because we don't really want to see some sales amount as a heading. Now, notice there's these little tick marks, and that's actually the name for them. Looked it up. And in my keyboard, it's the key right above my tab key. It's in the upper left corner. They're not quotes. In all the languages of SQL I've used, the variations, it's always just put quotes around it. Not in Spark SQL. Apparently, you got to do these tick marks. So that will allow you to put a space between the words. If you're just doing something um, like variance, technically, that doesn't need those tick marks. As you can see, this column doesn't. So we're going to do this one. This is just saying sum up and then give it a heading of total sales, tick marks, before and after, the little tick mark there, will allow that title. Again, if you didn't do that, it would give you errors because there's a space. If you don't have a space between your heading, there's no words you can put underscore or just do camel case, then you won't have that issue. Here we're going to do a round function because sales amount's going to come up with a lot of decimal points, and that's kind of ugly to look at. So we'll wrap the sum in a round function and the round second parameter says, how many decimal points do you want? How many decimal places? Zero means that we're going to get an integer back. And we're going to say that's total sales rounded. We're going to do a count and return that as order count. We're going to get average sales amount. But again, we want to round that so it's not so ugly. We're going to say max sale amount. We're not going to round it, but max sales amount. We're going to get the minimum sales amount. Max sales amount says, again, within our grouping, which is the year, give me the, low, the, the highest sales amount. And then the minimum says, give me the lowest sales amount. Standard deviation, STDDEV is standard deviation. And there's a sample version and a population version. So the sample version, I assume is sampling it. Uh, population should be doing it over the entire group that you're giving it. Uh, so we'll get that version of the of standard deviation. We also have a variance population. And then we have this cool thing, the correlation. So you'll see how strongly correlated is the sales amount to the unit price, right? And we're going to round that. We're wrapping some of these up again. And uh, finally, we have a really cool thing. I think sometimes people forget you can do this. You can use the having clause. Having is like the where clause, but the where clause is for row level queries, right? I'm selecting data and I want to do it where sales amount individually is greater than this or whatever. But the having says, OK, you've done the aggregation. Now with the aggregated results, apply this filter. And in this case, for the sum sales amount, you want to get it only when the sum sales amount is greater than 100,000. And I'm also going to sort it, right? I'm grouping, but that doesn't mean that the order will actually be sorted the same way you're grouping it. So I have to do an order by if I want that as well. So I'll run this. And we can see, as I said, you can see this is ugly because I didn't give it a column name. Uh, I just let it default. And there you got the year, total sales. And notice we have all these extra decimal places, which is ugly. So here I rounded it. And you can see that it even rounded correctly. So 25.9 rounded up here to 26. We have an order count, average sales, highest sales, right? We've got highest sales, lowest sales, standard deviation, variance, and correlation. I put this there for you guys because now I'm going to give you homework. Why should I do all this work? you got to do some too. It's too easy. You're just sitting there comfortable watching me do all the work. So I do, I'm do. i trying a new thing where I want 
people watch my videos to try it out. So in this notebook at the end, I have a query here, a question for you to write. In this case, fact internet sales, um, showing the order date, and then the first five characters of the sales order number, and then also get the length of the sales order number and the sales amount. So you're gonna put these things together. And I left you a nice convenient little cell here. You can write your code in. And then below it, I didn't wanna to be too mean. So I give you a solution in case you get confused or you just wanna be lazy, that's okay. Click here. Now this one's going to be using the aggregate functions. Get the total sales amount, average sales amount in the total sales amount minus the average sales amount and give it a column heading sales over slash under average. So you'll take a look at that. Group by sales territory key, uh, only returning results having, nudge, nudge, the total sales amount greater than 6,000. Here you code your answer. And if you wanna cheat, you can do that, but I know you won't. So that gives you some homework to do. Let me know in the comments if you think that's pretty cool and you like getting some work to do so you can try it out. And then you can see whether you got the idea of what we're talking about. So wrapping up, we talked about scalar functions and scalar functions we learned uh, they run over every row in the set, in the query, so they can be fairly intensive. They don't necessarily do a lot of work, but again, if you have a lot of rows that you're running through, it can take a little time. And we saw a lot of different versions. That's usually formatting or pulling some data apart. Then we looked at aggregate functions. Those are your summarizing, your averages, and anything kind of statistical functions that work over a group of data. And typically you'll know you're dealing with aggregate functions when you see the group by. In fact, if you say some, if you have a list and you're not using an aggregate function and you put a value, a column there, like the customer name or an ID column, you'll get an error typically because it says, I don't know what to do with that. You either have to give me an aggregated function or you're gonna have to group on that. So that's a common mistake I actually still make sometimes. Oh yeah, I got a I got a group on that. So just be aware if you see that, that's probably the problem. That's about it. So put comments in. I know I'm doing a lot of SQL here, but before I move on, I want to try to exhaust this topic a bit because SQL on Spark is really important. You can't overemphasize it. So I want you to get it through. And I know a lot of people may not be coming to Spark with a heavy SQL background. A lot of people do. I do. So I love SQL. But if you don't, then it's not a bad idea to get familiar with this. Thank you. Please put comments. Like above all. If you like what I'm doing, subscribe. Let Tell your friends. And until next time. I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thanks.